All right, so uh, today's lecture is going to be a starburst. No, not quite my name. But uh, anyway, uh, so tonight's lecture is going to be about uh, advanced whole board thinking. Yeah, starbursts are great, actually. But uh, a anyway, back to the main topic at hand. Um, last week I did a lecture for... Uh, players more in the, the double digit Q range. This one is meant more for uh, players approaching the Don levels. You prefer, you know, generally in the, the 6 or 7 Q up to 1 Q range, although anyone weaker is, uh, of course, obviously more than welcome into the room. But uh, just so everyone knows, we'll be moving at a, th this lecture is more aimed at people between the, <laughs> between the, the 1 Q, 1 Don, and uh, up to 7 Q range. So we'll be moving at a faster pace. Um, than uh, some of the other lectures, and we'll be covering uh, more advanced topics than uh, we might otherwise consider. So I have a few professional games lined up, and uh, some of them taken from, uh, actually all of them taken from a variety of very interesting books. And uh, so we're going to go through the game, usually it's only 15 to 20 moves or so, up to a certain point, and then there's going to be a whole board thinking question. And before everyone, uh, you know, in previous lectures, we've just had everyone uh, yell out the first answer that uh, comes into your brain just for fun. But, uh, you know, this time I'm just going to ask, uh, you know, for everyone to just uh, take 30 seconds, take a minute, and, you know, really think about the whole board position. And instead of just throwing out answers because, well, you think it looks interesting, you know, we're going to really look at the whole board and, uh, <laughs> yes, Tangan is potentially applicable. And we're going to really look at the whole board and uh, you know really think about what is the number one position. So, with that all, with that uh, being said, let's uh, get started. This is uh, an interesting professional game. I should have written down, <laughs> I should have written down the professionals playing in it. But this was for one of the one of the title matches back in two thousand. Uh, which one was it? Uh, the the Judon title match? I, I'm not sure. Anyway, this was a very high level professional game. So let's just, uh, you know, go over, if we uh, look over the opening game, we have a low Chinese opening. Uh, approach up here is pretty standard. And then a slide here. And now uh, something very common you'll find with low Chinese is that uh, black tanuki's here. Any ideas? Uh, this one you can all just uh, yell out. We're not at the, the key point yet, but any ideas where black might tanuki? Instead of playing R17, what might be a great move to work along with low Chinese? Ah, K4, one possibility. Yeah, K4, F3, those are the, the ones that should uh, hopefully immediately come to mind. Uh, Q5 is a, a pretty simple move for a normal opening, but uh, the whole point of uh, low Chinese is to uh, provoke your opponent into approaching the corner and then to uh, attempt to abuse him. Hello, Merrick. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining. So our, our uh, good professionals here used uh, F3. And so now this becomes interesting. Basically, it's like a Kobayashi's opening on the op on the bottom combined with a low Chinese opening. This is basically really what Black wants. But uh, White's territorial White's style is, yeah, I should have written down the professionals' names. If you guys want to wait like five minutes, I can get all the professionals' names for uh, all of these. Uh, let me actually let me see. I might have them written down. One moment. I'm going to see if I have these. Uh, names written down, because I would really like to know who's playing as well. One moment, please. Should only take me a second. Yes, 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 it's over 9,000, exactly. Don't play too much Dragon Ball Z. It'll rot your brain. Um... Where in God's name did I put that stupid, stupid name? All right, just give me like 30 more seconds. If I can't find it, then I will apologize. And I'll make sure to post the names when I end up posting this online at the end. So you'll still all definitely get to know who exactly was playing. But these were all taken from uh, uh, high, very high-level games, uh, title match type games. We were looking at some uh, very interesting positions. Aha! Found it! All right. So this was, yeah, this was the 10th annual Judon tournament back in 2004. White is uh, Yoda Norimoto, the Meijin, and black is Takao Shinji. And my pronunciation is or is absolutely horrible. So don't even laugh because I know it's horrible. Anyway, type it. Okay, I'll, I'll be typing them into the the YouTube video. Anyway, so Yoda's uh, yeah, it'll be posted on YouTube. Don't worry, the link will be in the room. So uh, Yoda Norimoto's his style is very very territorial. He basically takes some territory and then invades. Especially when his opponent's style is uh, very Moyo-based. 
So while most of us might consider something in the lower right, he actually just takes a very territorial move and pops in at uh, R17. I would uh, only recommend you guys try a move like R17 here if you really, really know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> he's very, very territorial in his style. This is this is a kind of move you would play here when this whole bottom right is really kind of scary. Only when you know what you're doing. Now, Black's move is kind of interesting. You know, the classical idea, of course, is to just say, oh, I'll just take Q5. But Black has another interesting idea that's a little bit nearby. Any ideas for any uh, alternative strategies that uh, Black might play in the lower right other than uh, Q5? Let's see, we have someone say N4. We have someone say P9. We have someone say O4. Someone say O3. A lot of interesting suggestions. P4, P5. O, O9 is uh, cool. So yeah, we have all these, so we have these wide Moyo moves around B and G. And then, no, 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 we're not at the thinking point yet. We're just at the yell out moves part. <laughs> Don't worry. This isn't really, we're not at the whole board thinking point yet. I'll tell you when we're there. So, these are all interesting choices. Black's move is actually one of these. Black's move is F. And this is a very interesting move. It's rather than just attempt to take the corner, like a move like F5 would do, this move puts a little more emphasis on uh, the, the uh, bottom side. The idea is to, uh, you, you know, the corner is a little bit open, but, uh, you know, if you really think about it, well, where, can white really approach the corner that easily since black already has a move like P4? It basically makes both places awkward for white to play. It's a really interesting move, and a move I would only play yourselves if you uh, really, th really believe it to be appropriate. It's uh, something of a high-level move. But uh, anyway, so white's response you'll find rather interesting. Rather than play anything fancy, White just dives in at uh, R4 first, and then Black just uh, obviously defends his corner, yeah? Black just defends his corner, and then White decides to try and, uh, well, fan no, no, it's not fancy. It's a, it's a classic technique, but if you haven't seen it before, it, uh, it looks a bit fancier than your, your classic approach. So fancy is a relative word. But a anyway, so this is the position now that we are thinking about in terms of Black. So we are we are the black zones, and I want everyone to take a second to think before we all start yelling out answers. And uh, you know, first of all, what is black trying to accomplish? What does uh, you know? Wh wh where does he want white to go? And you know, what would be uh, the best way for black to play? Considering so, first of all, you know, where does black have p real potential to make points? Any ideas? Where does black have the most potential to really make points? Yeah, the bottom's looking pretty nice. So the the bottom's looking nice. So the question is, do we drive him towards the bottom and then build while but build while forcing him, or do we force him towards the top, or you know how exactly? Yeah, the H three invasion is still there, but uh, White doesn't have time to invade H three because uh, his Q six stones are too weak. So anyone after uh, taking a second have any ideas what might Black decide to play here? So we have uh, P nine. We have 0607. Oh, another choice for 06. 06 seems to be popular. We have P6. We have N6. We have 07. See, you know, whole board thinking is really difficult. You get uh, all sorts of out there answers, and it's not like there's a, you know, there's like two answers that everyone focuses on. It can just be anywhere, and that's why these problems are incredibly difficult to uh, get right is because there's just so much variation. All right, so let's look at a few of these moves. All right, let's, uh, let's look at a few of these moves. So um, this move isn't that great for black because it's only really focusing on one stone. And what white can do is just play in and then descend like this. And all black has really done is, uh, you know, make white stronger. You know, White's, uh, White's group is strong now. If he needs to, he can uh, attach it to uh, R8 later. He can Atari at S5. There's maybe half an eye already on the right side. So, you know, it's uh, Black can maybe make a few more points in the corner this way, but uh, White's become much stronger. It's, uh, it's harder for Black to really attack him now. Um, so, same problem with this move. I mean, yeah, you're cutting the base out of the stones, but, you know, the center is uh, wide open. 
And so after this point, I mean, there's basically almost nothing else that, uh, you know, black can really do to attack white stones. I mean, yeah, he's made good points, don't get me wrong, but usually we want to see if there's maybe a bit more of an attack we can do against uh, white before just letting him go after two moves. Oh, no, points are good. You make good points, absolutely. You, you, you can't argue with making some points. So the moves up here... You know, moves with like this. This uh, this is uh, probably not the ideal direction. I, I guess we might say for uh, black to really push white in. I mean, really, my main problem with this is that you know, yeah, you can you can maybe make a few more points on the bottom, but first of all, the bottom is not solid yet. Yeah, and the top is thin. Remember, white has got an R17, so the top is a bit thin, and even after you take O6. I mean, it's not like it eliminates any, you know, uh, weaknesses that you have on the bottom. There's still all sorts of low invasions in there. It's not like it's a completed moyo that you're building up a new wall for. So, not not a big fan of the direction with this move. So, uh, similar similar comments with uh, E, C, and D. Now, A, A is a very interesting move. Um, it's not a bad idea, but uh, it doesn't quite put enough pressure on white. Now, the move that we actually have is uh, looks a little bit strange, but our, prof but our uh, professional's move was actually Q8 here, which uh, can seem a bit awkward at first, but really, Black is uh, Black's aiming for a few things from this. So, first of all, this uh, obviously makes R set R9 a lot stronger. You know, th there's no real way to push up against R9 from uh, this point forward, at least in the short term. So, White naturally has to jump, and then black can chase him once. Now, this is a very interesting point here. Now, this looks uh, potentially dangerous because we might fear, you know, a move like N4. But N4 is very, very dangerous for white to one point. I, I would, in fact, call N4 pretty suicidal on uh, white's part if he really wanted to play it. I mean, black can really just, bru you know, brutishly cut like this. And it's very, very hard for white to come out of this, uh, you know, smelling nice. Yeah, it's a, no, it's an ugly cut, but you don't have the ladder, so you need to. It, it is an ugly cut, but uh, sometimes ugly gets it done, and uh, that, this is one of those cases. You know, the empty triangle is ugly shape, and sometimes it's the best shape you can make in a, in a situation. Well, yeah, if black had the ladder, then that'd be great. So, yeah, the, the, the basic idea with wanting to cut a knight's jump is uh, N5 is usually considered the, uh, I guess you could say, prettier cut. You know, the more proper cut. If you have a choice between the two cuts, then usually N5 is considered the uh, the better option, simply because of the shape it provides you. Yeah, cut at the waist of the knight's jump, absolutely. But uh, sometimes when your opponent has the ladder, that's uh, not, a, not an option, and you need to do the more brutish cut at uh, 05, which is definitely a more brutish cut. So in this situation, his uh, opponent actually played here. He had to uh, hold back to a diagonal because he was scared of that. And this allowed to play to uh, black to play a very natural move, simply defending himself. And then white is now. Uh, this is a very good move. This not only th lets white out, but it's also aiming at a M3 to split black in half. Black obviously doesn't want that, so he has to defend right here. And uh, then, uh, following this, uh, white finishes up his shape with the move right here. And, uh, yeah, black takes a very nice chunk of cash. And uh, white's shape, white has good shape, but, uh, you know, he, we, no one can say he's alive yet. So, uh, let's, if we uh, continue on for a few moves, any other ideas, uh, what, what, what should black play right now? Should he continue his attack? Is there, Should he just tanuki and play elsewhere? Or, w what's the idea? R16, ah, tanuki. Does R16 count as a tanuki? That's, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's not 100% local, but it, it's with the, the, the overall group, the overall fight. So we have R16, no other uh, suggestions. Actually, very good choice. R16 is the correct move here. Because, you know, this uh, makes black solid. It helps strengthen the uh, R9 stones in case a fight happens. White stones are still uh, too weak to really invade directly. <laughs> yep, you are. And then uh, the sequence finished out with white extending and then black extending. And uh, O13 is another really good move here. Black is uh, subtly eyeing the uh, potential weakness in uh, white's shape. You know, this move can come into uh, play later if white ends up being chased, 
and it also has the added purpose of uh, keeping uh, O15 weak and uh, strengthening Black's uh, right side. So this is the first game. We had a, a somewhat obscure move. This game, this next one that we're going to look at, it should be a little bit easier to find. But uh, these, these are still all uh, difficult questions that uh, when I first look through them, I would uh, get usually, what, 30, 40% of them wrong. So these are uh, pretty difficult questions. So we have a, an interesting Joseki here with uh, e5. It's a little more unusual. But uh, the idea, of course, that white wants is to build up a big wall here and then approach white with uh, p4 because that's uh, you know a great approach for against the r4 stone and white wants to build up a big bottom position. So black plays a pretty standard variation. Oh, who is playing here? I have their names written. Nah. Yeah, white here is Cho Yu and uh, black is uh, Takao Shinji. And this was back in uh, 2003 in the semifinal round of the uh, NEC Cup. So this is a pretty standard, uh, pretty classic variation. This might look a little complex to people who haven't seen it before, but uh, this is actually pretty... Oops, that's not the right move. <laughs> White's usual proper move actually is just to extend because he's threatening to do uh, c5 now. And this is a pretty standard variation in terms of uh, what usually happens. But then uh, what comes next is uh, very interesting. White approaches. And so now it looks like white is going to build this really nice position on the bottom. And so the question is, what does black do? What is? And let's think for a second before we throw out answers. Let's, uh, we can consider, but let's, uh, let's think. No worries. Now, uh, so first of all, the first determination, you know, is how strong is white's bottom position? Is uh, this D3 wall, is it a really strong group that we're, that we're scared of? You know, and also, uh, what, what's up with R4? Is... Uh, R4 in severe danger? Should black just uh, take a big corner? Or uh, what's, uh, what's the idea? Ah, there's, there's an E4 defect. So we see that a defect exists, which is the first step. But then the second step is uh, attempting to use that defect in some way later on to our advantage. So let's... Uh, any ideas? Well, what do you guys think about a move like uh, P3? You know, the classic move to uh, take a big corner. Is this uh, effective here? Boo. Boo, no. Oh, why not? Why, why is it not good? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what white wants. Right. Good. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, white is just jumping for joy and uh, cheering for himself at, uh, <laughs> at this point. And black should really just uh, start thinking about getting a new job. <laughs> Any uh, any other ideas? Yeah, it, it really fixes them up. So now we're gonna spit out some moves. Now that we've had some uh, time to think. So we have uh, whoa, lots of choices. K three. We have M four. We have Q six. We have L four. We have M four. Magic sword. Well, you can't decide on magic sword just from uh, the first. Well, standard is a standard is a very very loaded word. <laughs> Pincers and extending are all about the whole board position. F four. M three. Now we have uh, every uh, every possibility in the book. We have a, a variety of pincers. A uh, move to play in between. A peep at the cutting point. A defensive move, a thank you for the T1, no no lecture would be complete without someone suggesting T1. It is extremely original, and I have never heard it before. <laughs> ah, yes, yeah, sorry, you got them out of your system? What about uh, I4? Hmm, kind of hard to play. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's uh, let's take a look at some of these moves. So uh, C here, this kind of suffers from the same problem as uh, P3, in that uh, you know it really gives White a uh, pretty flexible position and easy to uh, help him uh, uh, build the bottom. If White wants, uh, he can actually just play like this. This is uh, something of a newer variation, rather than playing uh, the Q3 move. 
because uh, sometimes players will, instead of defending on the right side, they'll start pincering, and it can get complicated. So what you'll actually see some players do now is uh, just play this directly. And then if black takes this move, white just descends, and if black wants to keep the corner points, he needs to do this, which ends in gote for him. So uh, white can play like this if he likes. Yeah, yeah, it can get annoying. So C is a little bit soft for black. So we have these ideas for all these pincers. And uh, we also have A and E. So, uh, you know, the thing about playing E, playing F4, right, playing uh, this peep right now, is, you know, it might be a great move later on. We don't know, though. You know, maybe we want to cut later on. Maybe we find later on that the E4 cut is really effective. Or maybe we find that, uh, you know, the F3 move, this, and a peep at F3, is uh, the best move here. The, the, the main thing here is we really don't know what uh, the best move for us to play there is going to be. And we don't really have any, you know, we don't have to play it right now. You know, it, it's one of those situations where we can just uh, see how the board develops. So playing E right now is a bit early. Um, playing A, A is possible, I suppose, but it, it also feels very, very nice in terms of, uh, <clears throat> in terms of what's being really done. And there's also the one-space pincers of N3 and N4. Yeah, so we can look at every pincer in the book. <laughs> so there's a lot of arguments for which pincer is best here, but the, a good principle to go by here, you know, most people think, oh, well, you know, his, uh, his, his group is, uh, uh, or, you know, I want to do a light pincer because he's potentially strong on the bottom. And, and that can be a good way to think sometimes. But, uh, you know, another thing to consider is that, well, he has this somewhat thick wall, at, le at least somewhat thick wall on the bottom left side and so you know maybe I, I don't want to get uh, that close to it if I don't have to and so one idea to play with that also works very well with shape is our professionals move which was N3 which is a pincer idea the pincer is absolutely the right idea but let's think about uh, why he chose N3 is that first of all there's a there's a lot fewer variations than a lot of the looser pincers you know when you have a looser pincer you give a lot more flexibility to uh, your opponent in terms of what he wants to do I mean here white really doesn't have that many choices you know he can do O5 he can do R3 he can I, mean, I guess he can potentially try P2 but uh, compared to the other looser pincers where there's you know eight original moves and then four variants from each of those moves there's a lot fewer variations and uh, he does that for a reason because he wants sente because uh, the opponent responds that uh, or Cho Yu responds at R3, and now uh, Black is deciding that uh, he wants to give up his R4 stone to uh, damage White's uh, potential Moyo stones. So now is where we really see uh, just something really, really simple, but uh, very beautiful happen in, on the go board. Yeah, all right, one, one second. Let me just uh, play out the next few moves, and you can uh, fire away. So we have uh, we, we want to ignore it. Black's idea with this is you know he can't respond regularly. If he just does a regular response... N3 is going to end up getting really badly attacked. So we know that Black doesn't want to play with F4 with R4 immediately. He's going to leave it for a little bit, and he wants to do something with N3. So uh, any ideas? What should Black do right now with N3 to make it uh, to to really do something with Black's wall to or White's wall to make it more solid? Now uh, we have an idea to F3. Threaten to go under. Seems like F3 is better than F4. Uh, we have a jump. Oh, you guys have a very good eye because our good professionals move. This was indeed uh, Takao Shinji's move. And he really likes F3. It's a great move. It makes white stones kind of look silly. Now, white's response is kind of fun. Instead of just uh, calmly defend, or instead of just, you know, making bad shape and defending at uh, E4, white actually defends by descending and uh, hurting black's corner. Because white cannot, uh, well, he can, but it, it, this is not a good idea for black to do. Even though it technically works, actually, I don't even know if it works. White can uh, consider counterattacking like this, even. <laughs> and now it gets very complicated. But uh, even, if, uh, even if white didn't want to do that, I mean, we basically get this. And this is exactly what uh, White wanted in the first place, you know, a, a big moyo. So, uh, yeah, and now N3 just looks stupid. So it would be a very bad idea for Black to do that. But Black has another good move. Any ideas uh, what should uh, Black play instead of uh, E4? Peep again. Which one? What are we peeping? 
uh, f4. We have a suggestion for g5. We have a suggestion for dot 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 dot. <laughs> g4. So like n5. Actually, our professional's good idea was indeed f4. f4 is a really, really good move here because it is sente. 100% sente against that cutting point at to e4. And white getting e4, he's forced to play it, does, uh, well, it does a similar idea, I suppose. But uh, there's this response for white to play. And that's kind of sente. Uh, if black doesn't respond to that, you know, it, it's uh, painful if uh, black doesn't respond. So the key here is that uh, black can spend his sente playing something really, really, really nice for himself. Namely, k4. And now suddenly, n3 just turns into a beautiful move in terms of shape. And this, going back to why he chose this pincer, you know, this is why he chose this pincer. If uh, he had chosen a different pincer, his shape would be a little bit more awkward. So this is uh, creates great shape for him. And now white has uh, no choice but to... Uh, attack the R4 stone, and then black gets himself out, and now suddenly what looked like white's thickness of D2 actually is uh, starting to look like a bit of a stick. But uh, white tanukis once again, actually, which I found very interesting when I first looked through this game, and uh, totally captures R4. And so black has essentially given up an entire corner and given white a huge wall. But in return, he has uh, claimed the left side, and has uh, gotten to chase white. And then they have a, a whole fight uh, continuing on like this, uh, and so on and so on. But uh, someone had a question uh, earlier. Isaiah, I think. Yeah. Fire away. Uh, white loses this game. Um, yes. Say black pincers, like uh, with N3, okay. Then R3 for white, okay. Mm-hmm. Black play R7, yes. You probably have seen R7. This is a pretty popular move on uh, KGS recently. It... <laughs> It annoys a lot of people to no end. So the simplest way to respond is just like this. And then don't tell me people respond like this. And this also really annoys you to no end. Because you want to play S3, but then he just uh, slides in at uh, P2, and everyone gets annoyed. So actually, the move for white here is to play P2. And then you have Mi. You can either uh, take your eyes or pincer or do some sort of uh, shoulder-hitting attack uh, against white. And it creates a mi. And uh, white also has for black shape here is kind of awkward on the right, so white still has forcing moves there too. So white, white can absolutely work with this. This is uh, perfectly workable for white. But yeah, if uh, if black just uh, plays this, then white can just go here, and white's uh, perfectly happy. So on to uh, the next game. Uh, let me see how does this one start. All right, okay. Let me uh, let me try and uh, one second. Let me find uh, whose game this is particularly. One moment, everyone. I have to find. The... I know I have it written down. It's a good thing to remember for next time. Remember the names of the professionals who played the games. One of those things you'd think I might remember one of these days. And somewhere I have it somewhere. All right, I can't find it right now, but uh, I will definitely put it on the online one. So apologies, this was from one of the major tournaments. I definitely remember. Now, this is a move that uh, might confuse some people if they uh, haven't seen it before. <laughs> this is a move that might confuse some people if they uh, haven't seen it before. Um, the idea is uh, to basically dare white to play f4, and then if white does play f4, 
black's just going to uh, slice on through. I uh, like this. Basically, and then uh, white will take outside and black will take corner. But uh, usually that's not ideal for black. There's, it also opens up a lot of interesting attacks against uh, c4. So black's response is pretty standard. Uh, black plays d5, which is a great defensive technique. It also is now uh, threatening uh, f4 a lot more effectively. Obviously, that's a huge threat. So uh, see a uh, Joseki knowledge and intuition from a slightly more uh, obscure Joseki. Any ideas uh, white to play here? Slightly off topic, but uh, nevertheless, a uh, good thinking for uh, some of the more obscure Joseki. We have a g3 suggestion. We have e5. Let's see. So we have e5. We have g3. This shape seems to be very popular. We have a f3. We have j4. Kosumi Town. <laughs> Lot, oh, j4. Whoops. <laughs> Lots of interesting ideas. So actually, uh, the normal Joseki here is actually this move. Creates a... Uh, hey, no cheating in downloading the SGF. No, no, that's cheating. No, don't blame any, don't, uh, don't accuse anyone of cheating. I trust everyone in the room. Anyway, also, it doesn't really help you. I mean, I, I don't know why you're just ruining the lecture for yourself. Yeah, you can, but you're just ruining the lecture for yourself. I mean, uh, it doesn't really hurt anyone else. Anyway, back to the game. So, this is a pretty standard sequence, and now white plays very actively here. And uh, white is uh, attempting to make himself strong shape, and black wants nothing of it. And white makes a co, and they start to co, and white plays a very big threat. And uh, since the game is so early, though, black uh, just decides to play solidly and make the exchange. And they both just have a tanuki battle. And so we get at this point. And so this is uh, much simpler than uh, some of the other examples. In that there's not uh, crazy variations or complex attacks. It's just, you know, there are two directions. Yeah, Carry On My Wayward Son is a great song. Anyway, so we, we basically have two directions, you know. Do you, do you shove black to the right? Do you shove black to the left? And if so, how do you do it? Do you, do you forcefully do it from one space? Do you, do you hold back to two spaces? Maybe do you cap them on top? It's a lot of decisions, but uh, lay, lay your head to rest. Yep, yep, another good song. Don't play too much Guitar Hero, though. Um, so, uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, hear any uh, ideas. Which direction and uh, how forcefully? How should black be pushed by white? So you have one suggestion for pushing him to the right. Ah, oh, we have one uh, suggestion for F17. Any other ideas? G17. D... D14. <coughs> D14. Yeah, these are uh, these are three good moves to look at. So uh, I'll throw in C14 to make it even. <laughs> M17 from the other side. Ah, okay, good moves to look at. Oh, and uh, sure, we'll throw in uh, P16. Up, uh, up here. So uh, yeah, let's uh, take a look at these moves. So first we have uh, the move at uh, M17 right here. This uh, this is a playable option. Actually, in the game, this was uh, the option that our uh, professional player played. But actually, this isn't the uh, ideal move for white. Because even though white can make uh, black a little bit uh, inefficient, you know, white's corner isn't solid either. And uh, Black's outside group is pretty solid. And White's corner still has Aji. Yeah, yeah, you want your cookies. So in actuality, we uh, want uh, exactly what you guys said. Uh, F17, B, uh, G17, F17. No, 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 you don't get a cookie yet. You have to earn your cookie. And they're delicious sugar cookies, let me tell you. <laughs> you really want them. 
Anyway, so in actuality, the proper move here... Oh, you don't like sugar cookies? Okay, fine. Be that way. Anyway, the proper move here is uh, G17. Because, well, any ideas? Why might, uh, why might G17 be the proper direction here? Thick? What's thick? Where? Force towards thickness. Yeah, white has a very thick position over at uh, Q17, absolutely. Yeah, and white will respond pretty simply. And now it is uh, white's turn, and white wants to play uh, something else on uh, the left side. But uh, the question is, where exactly on the left side should uh, white play? Any ideas? Ah, now we get some more responses. Come on, everyone's being so quiet. Fire away. We have a C15, C14, C16, D10, D11, D9, all sorts of moves. C15, D10, C10. Hmm. C15 or C16. All interesting choices. So, the the two basic ideas behind it, of course, are, well, A, B, and C are, of course, I'm going to try and take the corner, and uh, D, E, F, G are, I'm going to make a move on the side. And uh, both ideas are worth looking into, because uh, both obviously leave the other move open. So, obviously, if uh, White takes a move on uh, the D, E, F, G area, then, of course, that leaves his corner still open. And if white takes a move at the ABC area, ABC area, of course, that leaves uh, black the ability to make an extension. So we can't stop black from getting everything here. There's no choice, but uh, we do need to uh, take away one of them at least. So first of all, we have the ABC moves. Now, of these three moves, if we could only choose uh, one of these three, I would probably choose... Hmm, uh, difficult to say which one is necessarily the best one here. I guess I would be a fan of this move over the other two, simply because it uh, almost certainly will keep the corner. Uh, if you play this, uh, still a still a, a tricky amount of Aji here. It's a little bit trickier to uh, ensure that the corner is 100% yours. Mm, still some Aji. Same with A. But uh, if I was going to play their C, but uh, in actuality, what uh, White should do is... Uh, yeah, Kosumis have strange weaknesses. They're very mystical. Now, what we should do is actually extend here. Now, not only is a uh, extension good because, well, obviously it helps from uh, D16, but the other key point we have to take into account here is the black has this incredibly thick, super-powered wall right here that black would love, love, love to make an extension from. And so if we do do a move like this, you know, black is just going to be thrilled to take a move like this or something similar to it. but Greedy Me wants to play uh, C9. <laughs> so actually, you're right in that uh, white does need respect for black's thickness, and you know... No, no, uh, the, the left side here is uh, more important at the moment, simply because of black's uh, ginormous thickness. Oh, C11. Well, wouldn't you know it, C11 is our magic move. This is uh, the move that uh, is proper here. Now, the reason is, you know, the normal idea, of course, is to play right here. But uh, in this case, uh, white uh, feels a little bit awkward, simply because black's uh, gigantic wall is just so... I mean, black has spent a lot of moves, and there's a lot of dead white stones, and black's wall here is basically perfect. It's a 100% alive group. And yeah, well, there's still B15 Aji, but uh, the, the point being, this is just close enough where if Black tries to do something like this, you know, Black can still feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable that he's uh, extended too small from his gigantic wall. But it leaves a little enough space that uh, if White does anything besides a 3-3 invasion, mm, it's hard for Black to... It's harder than uh, C10 for Black to make an invasion. Though there are still invasions possible. Yeah, it's harder for black to make an invasion 
in the upper left compared to C10. Though they're still possible, but this is a this is a move which respects the fact that uh, black has a gigantic wall or in the, the lower left. All right, so th this one was pretty simple. The next one is going to be a bit more complicated. Let's see if I can... Uh, let me find the first few moves of this. Ah! <laughs> C19 pro move, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can uh, find uh, the professional names for this one. I'm pretty sure... Ah! Right, so this is a very interesting game. You should know these names. Uh, this game is from uh, 1999 in the uh, 25th annual Tengen tournament in the second round between uh, Cho Chikun, the Kisei at the time, and Takao Shinji. Uh, Cho Chikun was white, and uh, obviously Takao Shinji was uh, black. Very interesting game. So they start off here in the upper left with a variant of uh, the... Yeah, Cho Chikun, I, I love his style. But uh, so he, they start off with a variation of uh, Avalanche Josaki, which I would advise everyone in this room not to play ever. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a stupidly complicated Josaki that uh, is just uh, very annoying. And so this can start up the uh, large Avalanche if White wants. I hate I hate the large Avalanche. I guess it's a matter of preference. I mean, some professionals love playing Avalanche, and some uh, avoid it like the devil. Yeah, Taisha and Avalanche, they're they're kind of a pair. So the move to start Avalanche, of course, is uh, D13. But uh, Takao Shinji uh, didn't want to start up Taisha. He just wanted to, or didn't want to start up Avalanche. Or I mean, not Takao Shinji. Chochikun didn't want to start up Avalanche. He wanted to play uh, very, very simple. And so he plays uh, C13, which is a simple, solid move. And uh, so now it is a uh, black turn. And black can basically Tanuki from this. And so no, it's a very solid move. And so he takes, obviously, a huge approach. And, you know, this is all pretty standard stuff. And now we're going to see a slightly unusual move that is uh, we don't see very often. And Takao Shinji now plays uh, Q13. And this is one of those moves that uh, I would not play unless you really, really know what you're doing. Because uh, it's very complicated. It's uh, basically daring white to attempt to uh, attack black's Q6 stones. And it's also trying to develop his uh, topside moyo, so it, it's basically challenging black, t challenging white to either, you know, attack q6 if you can, or dive into the top. Well, white chooses to dive into the top. Now, this is a very uh, interesting placement move that uh, white attempts. You know, the normal idea, of course, is oh well, I want to play so I can make a two space extension on both sides, and you know, this seems to violate that principle. So you know, why would uh, why would Chocha couldn't play this? You know, this uh, this entirely violates the principle of uh, making two spaces on uh, extension on each side. Ah, puts a little more pressure on black stones. Yeah, yeah. There's there's an e16 weakness. Well, you 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 never want to say null a wall if it's a strong wall. But this is not a strong wall. White st or black stones are not alive yet. They don't have eyes yet. They don't have an easy way to make eye space yet. And remember, this is a very important move. White has also taken uh, C13, making it harder for Black to escape in that direction and making it harder for him to press oh, White's corner group. So this is actually a very, very solid move here. And so uh, obviously, you know, well, obviously Black cannot play a move like this. This is just a pitiful move that uh, Black should never even consider, um, ever. But uh, if uh, Black uh, pincers him from the other side, well, it looks really big, and, and it certainly is a, a big way of playing, but the, the problem is, you know, both sides can keep jumping, and Black just feel this makes Black feel, you know, Black is, sure, Black has made some good points in the upper right, absolutely, but uh, E17 is crying and sobbing, basically, at the fact that it had, just has no eyes thus far. Also, you know, Black's uh, upper right position still has a, a fair amount of invasion points, even if uh, Black gets another point, or yeah, Black's upper right still has some invasion points, and uh, Q6 also hasn't been strengthened. So you know, once Black's uh, top moyo has been reduced, Q6 becomes a, a lot more uh, appealing target to attack. So this is while tempting. This is uh, probably not the best way for Black to play in this situation. Now, finding the actual move, actually, I I failed. By, by the way, when I first went through this problem, I went through this book like uh, six months ago. I failed utterly miserably in attempting to find the right move here that uh, <laughs> that Takao Ch uh, Shinji chose. It's uh, not a move that uh, you will find or that I think anyone other than a 
absolute top level uh, amateur or a professional player will find without luck. Um, so, that being said, any ideas? So we have a season for J15. We have a, a C18. We have a, a J16. We have a E12. We have a L17. So uh, lots of interesting ideas. So we have, uh, first of all, moves to uh, look at this uh, D17 Haji. And, you know, there, there is Haji there. And we certainly could, if with a move like B, or something similar to B, we could certainly begin to uh, attempt to make ourselves I-shape with something like this. But uh, this just feels kind of too passive for black to play. It doesn't really put any pressure on white. And white just happily plays this move. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, black. even if black plays this, you know, white just goes up here, and it feels like, okay, black is safe, but uh, what does it really matter? It's a little too passive. So, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, we have, uh, oh, we have the jump out move. So this is, a, this is a good move to make black safer, but, you know, once again, it just doesn't do anything against uh, J17. Also, it leaves some really, really interesting weaknesses later. If white manages to get C17, not right now, but later on, it leaves some very, very, very frustrating shape weaknesses that uh, black would have to deal with. Um, so now we have, uh, well, we already talked about L17, and the reason being, you know, that the, the E17 group isn't entirely alive. Oh, we have a K16, another suggestion. Mm, so my fear with K16, it, it looks interesting. But uh, my fear with K16 is that you're pushing black, you're pushing white towards black's group, which isn't strong. And I'm fearing that uh, you're you're going to end up making a uh, black's group in the corner here. Black's uh, E17 stones even weaker in the process of doing this. So we have a uh, H16. Ah, H16. So H16 would certainly help this black group out, but uh, white's response is pretty simple. White just does this, and then, you know, something even simple, even if white just chooses to play very, very simple, and there are more complex variants that uh, white can attempt. But even if white just plays very, very simple, or even just like this, all white needs to do is play very, very simple. And, uh, you know, black black feels awkward. J16. Ah, J16 actually is the move. <laughs> it, looks, uh, it looks a bit odd here. But uh, the idea behind it is, well, you need to get black out, and you need to get black out strong. You, you need to make sure the black group is safe. And you don't mind attaching to white as much as normal, because black group isn't alive either. So because uh, black's uh, D16 stones aren't strong yet, you know, it's okay to attach, because uh, both of your groups are weak. So white is trying to give black as few forcing moves as possible. And now, you know, it's... Uh, Black gets this lovely move at uh, h16, and this is much better than playing uh, h16 first, because uh, it would be like black playing here, and then white doing this, and then black doing this, and this would this would never happen. I mean, it's uh, it's funny to even uh, talk about, but uh, yeah, this is what uh, black manages to get, and then white uh, goes to get himself out. And black has a very powerful double Hane here. Yes, that is the move. It's uh, not a move that uh, most players will see very easily. And then white plays a very uh, good move uh, that you will see players take off. And the E18 move here, now white's intention here, white intends uh, to keep Sente here. He doesn't need to uh, cut at uh, E17 yet. But it leaves a lot of Aji there if white wants to take a D13 later. So white saves that for later and then takes a O16. And so, you know, white has made himself safe and uh, black has made himself safe. And this can uh, generally be considered something close to uh, par for the course for both of our pros. Black has uh, managed to get himself out nicely without uh, too much danger and also managed to make himself some points. 
and White has managed to make himself safe, and White still has a move like uh, N13 later, if that Moyo ever becomes really, really threatening. Uh, which uh, high shoulder hit were we talking about? Yeah, the cap is a little bit too nice, is uh, my fear. Cap's a bit too nice, I think. I mean, it's, it's, a, simil it's a similar idea. But, uh, I mean, White will probably res end up responding like this. And if we play out the classic variation, although there's all sorts of incredibly, incredibly complex uh, uh, continuations from here, if uh, White just plays very, very, very simply, we can uh, expect something along these lines. And then uh, Black doesn't have to fix his weakness there just yet. He can uh, just play out here. And uh, it's a little bit nicer. H15... Oh, you mean the knight's cap. That's not the uh, high shoulder hit. Knight's cap. Good move to know. Knight's cap. Yeah, this is this is still too nice. Yeah, this is... Uh, knight's cap is a, a great move. Yeah, but this... Sometimes. But this is still too nice for uh, white. White is uh, very, very happy to have gotten himself out. So that's uh, not an easy move to find. All right. So uh, next game. Oops. Let me see if I can... Uh, ah, right. Let me see if I can find author of this one. If I can find it. Ah, yes, I did. Okay, so this is a game also with uh, Takao Shinji, who is, uh, go figure, one of the authors of uh, the book. Yeah, Takashi Jiu, he's one of the authors, and it's about his games and some of the mistakes that he made and also some of the good moves that uh, he made. He's really strong. I, I really like him. Uh, I, I like his style a lot. So black here is uh, Takao Shinji, the Honimbo at the time, and white is uh, Yamada Kimio, whom I have uh, never heard of. Some of these problems are from his uh, Takao's astute use of uh, Brute Force book. It's a, it's a somewhat higher level book. But uh, you can uh, absolutely uh, purchase it. I'm, I'm not exactly sure who sells it. Um, Hinoki Press. I don't know who sells their books. Anyway, so this game is a little more involved. We're not just going to look at the first 20 moves. This one goes a little bit deeper. But uh, so, you know, we have a pretty uh, standard opening. The idea behind this, though, is, of course, uh, you know, it's uh, like low Chinese. But uh, since he can't approach, he's just playing the, uh, the, the L17 move, which is, uh, you know, trying to make the, the, corner the, the corner approach for black or for white at uh, p16 a bit awkward so then uh, the game uh, continues the pace and white takes r5 and this is a this is a really big move now this is a move that might uh, confuse some people at first because it's only a two space extension but it's a very 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 important two space extension it uh, first of all it stops it uh, basically sente because it's threatening these uh, d16 stones or at least it's uh, threatening to severely hurt them if white doesn't do anything, and then it also uh, ha helps defend the upper upper right. It prevents white from making a, a J17 move. So white's move is also very interesting. Um, this is a uh, dead for development. Yeah, this is uh, another kind of move that I guess I would suggest you play only with uh, extreme caution uh, before attempting a move like this. Now, the more normal ideas for white are, you know, D13, D14, uh, C16 here is pretty standard. But uh, this, is a, this is a bit more uh, complicated of a move. The idea behind it is uh, white is assembly, essentially daring black to uh, attempt to uh, cut directly and uh, keep his uh, C15. If he wants to keep his C15 stone, then uh, white will happily fight. If they have, you know, if Black tries a classic type of splitting move, it looks very complicated. Yes, if he tries a, a classic sort of uh, splitting move like this, uh, something like this can be done. And uh, notice that D12 is further away than it normally might be at D13, or even D14. Well, mostly D13. So it, it's a lot harder for Black to uh, attack, or at least a little harder for Black to attack uh, the, the D12 stone. And so we can get all sorts of complicated fights that uh, arise out of this. But that, that's, that's basically what white's okay with. But uh, black has other ideas. Whoops. Black uh, responds uh, rather creatively. Now, you see this a lot. 
And, you know, when most player players are Q players, they normally learn to hate this move. Because, you know, the, the fear is, oh my god, blacks or white's obviously just going to cut me in the middle at uh, d14. But uh, if you time it right, uh, moves like uh, eve13 can be very, very effective. Because, first of all, you're threatening this uh, d12 stone if, uh, white doesn't, er, if uh, white doesn't defend it. And then also you're threatening to do a great shape move at uh, e15. You know, if you do e15 now, in comparison to earlier, if, uh, you know, assuming white does some sort of move to defend d12, if uh, black wants now, he can just extend out here and make a really, really big co right here. So it allows black to be uh, more forceful with uh, the, the, C, the, the e15 move, if he wants to later. It's a very flexible move, willing to go in many different directions as a... Well, no, he can't play the co right now. Right, right, right. So, you know, it's all a matter of timing. So white just decides for a very simple move. He's just going to trade with black. Uh, Yamada, I haven't really seen any of Yamada's games before, but apparently he has something of a territorial style, because this is a move which gets you a very nice corner, but uh, leaves black with a fairly good outside. Pretty uh, standard exchange. Now this move, this is one of those uh, shape moves that you see that... Uh, just makes you scratch your head at first, but uh, it's actually superb. Any ideas for uh, white's uh, proper shape here? It's a very simple move. Very, very, very simple move. Yep, the simplest there is. B14. Incredibly simple. It does a lot of things. It uh, threatens to connect at C12. It eliminates any and all Aji from black attempting to do anything bad with uh, D15. It is a great move here. And so black naturally has to play this move to uh, complete a shape. And then white also completes a shape. This is more to uh, stop black from making a uh, easy outside moyo. Also of the fact that uh, now there is a lot of th there is a fair amount of Aji against uh, the, the B14 stones now if uh, black gets D15. So this is a great move to stop the Aji and to also stop black from making a big moyo. So this is an interesting move. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but uh, let's just hear it. Why did black choose uh, L3 instead of K3? Okay, but why? Why did he choose it? Two space from where? Two space in both directions, sure, but so does so does K3. K3 can go two spaces in both directions, so why is why is L3 different? Why is it superior? Why did he choose it? It's just random? Threatens a larger moyo, leaves less space, makes R5 inefficient. These are, uh, yeah, these are all getting the, the general idea. Most uh, specifically, no, 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 it's not a matter of greed, actually. It's absolutely not a matter of greed. It is the reverse of greedy. This is a, a move offering a trade. So what black doesn't like here is that white has invested two stones into the bottom to develop his uh, bottom area, whereas black has only invested a single stone. So thus, go theory goes that white now has more potential to develop the bottom than black does. So L3 is something of a, uh, I guess you could call it uh, bottom side nullifier. It uh, attempts to basically turn the entire bottom into uh, nullness. Because, you know, if uh, black plays a K3 here, you know, white might not play it immediately, but uh, M3 is still a, a fine move. Not now. Not now. This is too good for black now. But later on, M3, it's still a really big move. But, uh, you know, if black takes this move, white would be a lot more loath to settle for something like this, which is just, you know, really close to his uh, solid corner. It's much smaller for white. Now, the trade-off, of course, is that you give white a lot more space to uh, invade around F3. But that's exactly what black is planning. The basic idea behind the move is to let white invade at uh, F3, let white make a two-space extension, and then black can still make a two-space extension to uh, O3. And so both sides will make a group, two groups on the bottom side, each one of them giving them maybe, what, five to ten points, and the bottom side essentially becomes big for nobody. So that, that, that's the purpose behind L3, but it's only a good move when played in a proper context. It is when black does not care about developing his own bottom, and he more wants to pursue, what's the Japanese word, uh, what is it called, amashi? 
I don't know. It's a uh, you know reducing or eliminating your. Uh, I'm not good with the Japanese terms. Uh, your opponent's potential. So White's uh, response is uh, pretty standard in this case. White decides to take him up on his offer and says, you know, okay, I will uh, allow you to reduce me and I will reduce you in return. And it's a perfectly fine move for White to play. I, I should note that there's nothing wrong with uh, just doing this. So Black kicks because uh, White can only make a two-space extension, which makes him a bit inefficient. But uh, now the normal idea here for Black is to O3. And O3 isn't a, a terrible idea here, but it's a little bit lukewarm, I, I guess we could call it. Little bit lukewarm. Ah, K5. Well, someone has a good eye. Yes, K5 is indeed the move the Black plays here. It's a very, very powerful move. And why is K5 a good move, though? So you, you found it's a good move. Why? Any ideas? Why is it a good move? Well, it has a follow-up. It threats eyes. It uh, makes white weaker. Yes, all, all very playable. We can still take white space, but uh, maybe is there something uh, whole board that uh, this move is looking at? No, we're not looking at Tengen. Ah, we're looking at some sort of Nomoyo. And Black has a lot of development potential on the left side. You know, especially with this uh, really, really big wall. So the idea is that if we push White up a little bit, it will let Black build himself more points on the left side. So by playing this move first, we uh, make it so White is still unsettled. And, uh, you know, White Stones are still unsafe. So uh, now it is uh, White's turn to choose a potential move. Any uh, ideas White to play? Black has just attempted to threaten you. So I need to do something to make himself stronger. So F7. We have a suggestion for H5. Mm-hmm. We have a suggestion for C3. We have a suggestion for H4. Lots of interesting ideas. F2. Okay, these are, uh, these are all good choices. You know, anyone else, feel free to speak up. Fire away. <laughs> no, don't throw up like 20 moves. That's that's just annoying. Oh, you're making a sequence. I thought you were just saying ideas. Uh No, I wouldn't recommend that sequence. Let's see. Okay, so all interesting ideas to look at. So, there is of course the jump out directly move, but uh this move still makes me feel a bit awkward. Um, I feel like the shape has some real weaknesses to it that White is always going to have to worry about unless he plays another defending move. You know, two space extensions into the center are good for moving out quickly, but uh, they have, uh, well, you know, F F6 is something to consider later on. Right now, maybe it's a bit too early to uh, immediately go for the cut, but, you know, it, it just leaves this annoying weakness that's just sitting there and waiting to be played. And White always has to worry about uh, coming back to it, that uh, there's this, this cutting threat. And yeah, you know, Black might even want to consider uh, potentially some sort of a... I mean, you'd have to read out very carefully, but there's all sorts of evil complications that uh, can arise from this that you just have to read out very carefully. But it, it's very, very complicated, and needlessly so. Black, White doesn't need to uh, 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 be this complicated. Um... So uh, so the problem with going into the corner directly is that uh, White's uh, F3 stones are still very weak. And so, you know, White can live. There's a pretty standard technique for White to live in the corner. So White can live without much of a problem. But, uh, you know, the problem is, well, what happens afterwards? And uh, afterwards, White is in uh, big trouble. Yeah, that, that's a mojo. 
you know, even if white manages to make two eyes in there, it's really not worth living at that point because black will have just built a, a, a godly sized wall. So corner jump might not be a, the best strategy when your, your group is still in danger. So E2, I mean, yeah, that does make you a bit stronger, but, uh, mm, I mean, well, white, black could honestly just respond uh, simply. And I guess my problem with this for black is that you've conceded, or my problem with this for white is you've conceded the corner for black to black, and, you know, your group isn't that much safer than it was. I mean, it's not like you can say, okay, my group has two eyes, and now you can run off and, you know, go have fun and dance. You know, your group still isn't 100% safe. And you've given black the entire uh, up bottom left corner and uh, to stop the 3-3 invasion. So not a, not a fan of that move. My groups always have two eyes. Yes. Yes, of course they do. Of course they do, Rukus. So actually, our correct move here is the very simple uh, H5. The idea is to uh, not allow uh, K5 to easily become strong. Yeah, he's gotten a lot of moves right. Very impressive. So uh, this is uh, definitely a move to make white stronger. And so now black plays a very interesting move, which I particularly like, which is a cap. And this threatens to do so, so many things. And this is one of the reasons why I, I really like it. So I mean, first of all, you're obviously threatening to play a move, you know, around A, which just uh, makes a huge moyo. You're uh, threatening to connect up all your stones right here, which makes Black's, uh, you know, all of his stones very safe. Yeah, he's really using this uh, this big wall. He's uh, just saying, I'm going to, yep, another elephant jump. Elephant jumps are great to play when you know how to play them. But when you play them wrongly, they can end up being very, very, very bad for you. So white, uh, so black has this really, really weak uh, K5 group. It's still not strong yet. You know, it doesn't have an extension. And white wants to escape. So the most important thing right now is, yeah, to uh, split those. <laughs> we, we can say complex moves for cues. If you can find the right situation to play it in, then they can be great. But, uh, you know, put a giant, giant caution sign on uh, when you might play it. So then, uh, this is a very, very interesting move that uh, most that isn't maybe the most immediately uh, uh, intuitive, but uh, the idea behind it. So obviously, Black wants to make uh, L3, this L3 zone, a lot stronger. Yet uh, he doesn't just make a regular two-space extension like uh, you know O3. Why is he playing a move like uh, P3 instead of O3? Any ideas? Why? Why P3? Ah, oh, he watched Starstorm's probe lecture. Yes. Well, you know, he could probably teach me a lot of things about probes, so I don't know about that. Yeah, build up strength. Yeah, so Sente, build up strength. But uh, the other thing is uh, shape here. Uh, as we're going to see, it works brilliantly well with uh, this uh, K5 stone that he's just played. His uh, shape works magnificently. So let's see what happens. Yeah, it does settle the group. And the idea is it uh, it settles it easier than O3 does. But in return, you make white's corner a little stronger. So black is willing to give that up. This is a pretty classic sequence. And now, voila! And suddenly, black's uh, thin knight's jump looks like beautiful, beautiful shape. And uh, black has just made himself superb shape. And so he can be very, very happy with himself. Now, white, of course, needs to uh, get himself out. Yeah, and black didn't give that much. I mean, white already had the lower right corner. So yeah, the lower right corner became a little more solid, became a little bit bigger. But, uh, you know, it's not like he gave up a huge amount. It was already, it already belonged to white. This is a very, very good shape to know. So white uh, continues running himself. And black, and suddenly, you know, we're looking at the board, and suddenly this, uh, this left side is starting to look like it could be some points. It's uh, starting to shape up into some kind of moyo. And now this this is an interesting move that, uh, you know, I, I would, if we were just doing a look at this one game, I would uh, spend a lot more time on each individual move, but uh, we're looking through quite a few. Maybe one day we can do a, a review of just a, a single game and we can go really, really in-depth into a, a few specific move choices. But uh, the, the abbreviation of this is that uh, white is essentially daring black to try and do a move like uh, L7. Because if he does, then white's going to take a move like uh, J10. And so uh, 
White wants to play a move like uh, L7 in the future, but uh, he's daring Black to play it because Black's uh, H8 group is still in danger of being hunted on its head. If something like this happens, Black does not want to attempt. Black does, uh, yeah, this whole game is I dare you to cut me. That's, you know, a lot of times you'll find with professional players, it's I dare you to attempt to cut me. But, uh, yeah, Black does not want White to hit him on the head at uh, H9. That is a severe reduction for uh, Black's potential Moyo. So, Black plays a very interesting shape move. Now, the idea behind this move is to uh, attack uh, N4, N7. So by threatening the stone, his idea is he wants black or he wants white to defend his stone, and now maybe uh, or potentially later on he can launch an easier attack against n7. But black may end up playing elsewhere for now. But uh, white will not oblige him, and white says, "Okay, you can make yourself stronger." So white is essentially saying that you know what, I'm not going to make any more attacks against uh, this uh, o3 group. I'm essentially saying, "Okay, it can live whenever it wants without any problem." But in return. I am going to reduce your left side. And now, you know, notice that uh, because he has this uh, bigger wall, N7 is starting to look a lot more solid than it was. And black plays very, very aggressively here. Black could just extend, but uh, the extension here is very, very slow. Yeah, th this is an I dare you to cut. The extension here is kind of slow. Uh, you know, white escapes without a problem. And then black can say, oh, well, look, I've made this big moyo, but uh, there's still, you know, Aji in here. There's still a 3-3 invasion. So we can't say that black's moyo is 100% solid. And, you know, there's still reduction over here. So, you know, we can't say that this is all massive points for black already. And uh, white's group is already, you know, basically uh, safe and outside. So we can't really say that this is satisfactory for black. So black decides that he needs to be more aggressive. Now, uh, what, what should white do? Any ideas? White to play? Well, yeah, we have a H... Oh, F7. Let's see, we have K9, we have... Uh, H9, a few suggestions, certainly. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at these moves. <laughs> I dare you to cut, okay. Yeah, that, that's one way of responding. So this is, still, uh, this is still a bit of a thin move. Makes me worry. Um, I mean, black can't play uh, F6 very easily, but if he plays a move like this... I, I fear a bit for uh, the shape. It's uh, it's it seems like it's very very dangerous for whites to play around with. Um, maybe later, but uh, not for now. Not for now. <laughs> Danger equals fun. Well, good fun. So the honey here. This is this is much too nice to black. Black is thrilled. Black just takes the double honey here and then uh, just starts uh, patting himself on the back for uh, making a really nice, really beautiful moyo while still threatening white. No, in actuality, the people guessing uh, H9 were right. White goes directly for the cut, and now begins a potentially very, very complex fight in the center. And, uh, you know, the entire game is at stake. First of all, we have this entire Moyo on the left that is not quite finished yet. We have this white group, J16, which is kind of uh, floating. <laughs> So, any ideas, uh, black to play? Uh, black to play, any ideas? K9. K9, K9. G9. J10. J10. Lots of interesting ideas. I'm guessing G9 is too passive. H7 is lacking liberties. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at these. So this, yeah, this is a this is a bit too nice. This is essentially uh, letting black get away or letting white get away with his cut. I mean, black can make a, a sizable moyo by doing this, but uh, you know, white gains a, a fair amount outside. And the weaknesses we talked about around uh, the F6 area, the C3 area, and the B11 area, they're still there. So. 
So the question really is between A and C. And it's a, it's a complicated question, because on the one hand, you know, White has a weakness to abuse with his uh, N7 stone. But on the other hand, you want to put as much pressure as possible on uh, H9. So it's not uh, not the easiest question in the world, or immediately intuitive, but our uh, good professional decided that this was not the best move here. Actually, he does none of the above. He defends himself immediately, which I found to be very, very interesting. You know, everyone wants to immediately focus on uh, working that cutting point. But uh, all that time he was looking at, uh, yeah, he was afraid. Well, so this is really interesting for him. I mean, uh, it leaves white with a, a potentially tricky problem because uh, black is about to develop himself a really, really nice moyo, obviously, if he gives him the chance. And this fixes black's weakness very effectively, or at least for now. So white's move here is basically the only move white can play on the go board. And black's move also shouldn't uh, confuse anyone. It's uh, pretty simple. And then white also plays a very, very simple move. And then uh, now we have a very intuitive move. And uh, we still have a very intuitive move. And so now this is the main situation for this game. And before anyone yells out anything, I want everyone to uh, take a look and uh, think for a second about uh, any ideas for black before we yell out. So let's consider a few things first of all. First of all, White's group isn't alive yet. Black has a bunch of stones in the area, but uh, then again, so does you know White has a few friends over here to connect to, and also, you know, Black's uh, K11 group it's uh, it's not a hundred percent alive yet. So Black has a uh, caution at uh, the the Black needs to be cautious with his J11 K11 stones, and then he also has these two stones, which are basically pretty tough to uh, push white into. And then we have to take into account the fact that he's trying to still develop his bottom and uh, you know what he can do for that if that's more important. So you know if we uh, if we look at all this, what's uh, what, what's the most important thing to do? Should he just defend his K11 group? Should he develop his uh, left side area? Should he pressure white with a cap? Ah, we defend K11. So let, let's see any uh, ideas. Ah, stop the connection and attack. So Great principles. How do we apply it? Ooh, lots of ideas. This is a uh, this will probably be our last one of the night. So if you have an idea, fire away. So we have a uh, B12. We have M M8 J13 H14 G13. Jeez. So many moves. I don't think we'll be able to look at every single one of these moves. Uh, H14. Uh, <laughs> Wants to be different, huh? Uh, R. K13. Here. Oops, no. Here. Uh, okay. These are, uh, I don't know if this is every single move, but this is a, this is a good selection to look at. So uh, let's uh, take a look at a few of them. So F and B, uh, they definitely make uh, Black's uh, K set, K11 stone stronger, but uh, they don't really do that much against, uh, against the H12 group. They kind of uh, ignore the, the vital situation that's going on on the board right now. You know, we're very worried about this uh, H12 group. It's in this critical area where Black has a weak group, Black wants to make a moyo. Black wants to do so many things. And so somewhere in uh, this relative area is where Black needs to play. Build the right. Well, the right's very, very open. So, I mean, we could start building the right, but the right is, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's super open. Oh, no, he said uh, G11. So, uh, you know, I mean, we could, but we already have this uh, other areas that are already developed that it might be easier to build from. So, you know, we, we don't really need to necessarily start from scratch. So, uh, let's see, a few more moves. So this move, this is a very tempting move because it stops White from uh, connecting to his buddy stones. And that's always, you know, one of those uh, one of those things that everyone always wants to do is to stop White from uh, connecting to his friends. But uh, mm, it kind of leaves a... Uh, I fear it kind of leaves uh, K16 to the wolves, 
and also leaves Black's uh, left side kind of open. Mm, it's not the easiest thing in the world to launch a, a very uh, severe attack, I fear, against these stones. So, similar thing with this. I mean, at the end of the day, it's probably just going to end up hurting uh, K11. You know, we should not split just for the sake of splitting, or just for the sake of stopping to connect. Sometimes, you know, if we can make a good enough benefit, or if we can chase elsewhere, it's uh, not the end of the world if they do connect, as long as we can make enough potential profit. So, uh, C and G are uh, very good moves to uh, consider. And this is a potentially intuitive option, because, you know, it, it's obvious, and it protects black, but here, it's a little bit too nice to white because black's left area is still very undeveloped. And if white plays a move like this, he has this dual use of uh, helping his stones make eyes while uh, eating giant bites out of uh, black's potential moyo. And that's being very, very, that's allowing him to be very, very efficient. And so if we just have a, a basic variation, you know, this creates all sorts of uh, annoying complications that uh, black has to deal with. I mean, there's uh, complex cutting points at e6. This is, uh, this is probably not okay for... Uh, this is probably not okay for black. Black has a few problems to deal with. Um, first of all, white still has this move, which is very tough to stop entirely. Also, uh, black has an annoying cutting point here, and black really needs to respond right here. And there's at least one eye that uh, white can probably man manage to make in uh, the center already. Plus, there's a forcing move here. It's it's really, really tough here to launch a great attack uh, against uh, white at this point. Now, black can build up maybe more of a wall out here. And that's not terrible. That That's certainly possible. But uh, my problem with it, I, I don't think it's that easy to develop a great moyo here. First of all, because white has uh, these... Uh, L7 and N7 stones kind of uh, sticking in to uh, this potential moyo area. And it's still very, very open in terms of the right side for developing. So not the easiest way for black to want to play. But it's uh, the right idea. But the first move we should do is uh, actually right here at uh, F9. And the reason why this is possible is because of the strength here. Now, you know, the fear that uh, we might initially have is that uh, white can easily do this. But this is this is very, very dangerous for white to contemplate. Once again, we have a, uh, a rather ugly cut. A rather uh, ugly cut that uh, works very well. This is, this is very, very difficult, I think, for white to play and manage. So once again, rather than a, uh, even though it's a little bit uh, brutish of a cut. So once again, white is forced because of his shape, because of black's uh, shape strength over here, to play a move like this. And that lets uh, black continue to play a uh, still pretty good move at uh, L13, which is basically what black wanted to do. But uh, black also got, in addition to uh, chasing white, he also got to play his move here. And so I think Black can be uh, rather, satis rather satisfied with himself for uh, having managed to get this. Now, if White tries into Nuki's earlier and says, "Oh well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try something like this earlier," this is very bad for White. Now White is uh, very sealed, and Black has basically made himself a new Moyo. This is a, you know, this this H12 stone is a super vital point. It uh, creates Moyos at will, basically. <laughs> it develops. It it's basically developed a new Moyo for Black, so Black doesn't even mind that much even if white manages to uh, squeeze life outside in there. So, uh, yeah, that about uh, P5 has annoyed me the whole game. <laughs> yeah, white tanuki from there way earlier. So, yeah, that uh, about sums up tonight's lecture on uh, whole board thinking. So, you know, the basic point is whole board thinking is a very, very difficult subject, and it can oftentimes be difficult to say that one move is the absolute best move on the board. But, uh, you know, it, it just takes so many different factors to uh, make uh, correct whole board decisions, and it's one of the most difficult things to do in Go. You know, you, you have to take into account the relative strengths of your groups, 
where you can build. Can you make a moyo? Can you stop your opponent's moyo? Does this build me a moyo? Does this stop my opponent's moyo? Where am I strong? Where am I weak? I mean, there's just so many factors to think about when doing whole board thinking that it is uh, incredibly, incredibly difficult, even even for professional players. I mean, when professional players do make mistakes on those rare occasions that they do, one of the most common places is in uh, these whole board thinking situations because uh, they are just so viciously complex to get right. But, you know, if you if you can get a good understanding of uh, these kinds of whole board thinking situations, you will very, very quickly become uh, very strong. But, uh, yeah, with uh, that being said, I will end the lecture for tonight, and I will post it on YouTube if uh, anyone happens to want to take a look at it later. And I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself, and I'm sorry for being an hour late tonight. <sighs> and I need a throat lozenge.